Uh, the other thing I wanted to let you know about, uh, I'm sure you're not aware because you have a life, so you don't have to keep up with this stuff. But this weekend marks two years since we moved into the Four Center, since we had our first service in this building. And a lot has happened over the last two years. And I just wanted to pause and thank all of you who have played a part and played a role in seeing so many lives changed here over the last couple of years. I sat down this weekend and I, was, I thought, you know, let me just go back and look because you get caught up in everything going on. And there were a couple of things that stood out to me. One of them was this. Since we opened the building two years ago, our average weekly attendance has increased by 94%. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty remarkable. Which means there may be more of you here who are new than not new. Don't organize and form a coup, okay? But you got... We got a lot of new folks, and I absolutely love that. I mean, this is extraordinary. And you know, seasons like this, they don't last forever, but man, God's been so good to us, and he's used you guys in some incredible ways to reach a whole lot of people and impact a whole lot of lives. The other stat that I found interesting was since we've moved in the building in the past two years, we've also given $374,692.49 back to our communities. That is, yeah. That is a stunning number to me. It is unbelievable. It's all because of your generosity. Um, it has made such a difference in so many nonprofit organizations and so many families. So again, huge thank you. And for those of you who are around uh, Journey in the you know, pre-4 Center days, whether it's CFSB Center or all the way back to Kerr Center, we were portable for 16 years. One, for those of you who are new, you need to know, really the only pushback or the only concern that we got that I heard whenever we said, okay, it's time to, to build a facility now, the only pushback we heard was, okay, it just can't take away from our ability to do what we're doing in the community. We don't want to build a building. If all the money's going to go to the building, we're not going to be able to, to do everything we've done. And so I was looking yesterday, and um, what you've given over the last two years is more than $131,000 more than we have ever given in a two-year period in the history of our church. So y'all have blown it out of the water. Um, it has just accelerated our ability to make an impact. And it's just a reminder, this is so important, it is just a reminder that when we built this facility, we didn't build it because we cared about having a building. I think we proved that over 18 years. We, we built it because we just felt like it was the, another tool that we needed, the next tool that we needed to be able to reach more people, to be able to make a bigger impact. Um, because we've said this for years, and if you've been around here very much, you've heard me say this. We're not a meeting place. That's, we've never been defined by a building. We're not a meeting place. We're a movement. And every movement is organized and centered around a mission. And our mission just, it, it's so important to us, and it has to say so, so central to who we are, that we just need whatever tool we got to have to accomplish it. And that's actually why I want to talk to you about the next couple weeks. We're starting a new series today called Next Generation Church. And I want to talk about the next step, the next tool that we may need in order to keep doing the mission that God has given us. If you're new around here, our mission is really simple. Our mission is simply to inspire people to follow Jesus. That's it. Just to inspire people to follow Jesus. To which you might say, well, isn't that the mission of every Jesus-centered church? Um, yes and no. Yes, theoretically, but the thing that makes us a little different and distinct is this word people, because when we say people, we really do mean all people, not just people who grew up believing like we believe and, you know, going to church and understanding all the stuff. We really do mean everybody, the people who don't believe, the people who aren't sure, the people who grew up in church, had a bad experience, they walked away, the people who just, you know, didn't get good answers to the questions and they thought it just doesn't make sense. People got hurt by Christians and they're like, I just, I can't do it anymore. We really do want to create a place that everybody can come and that they can feel like they belong even before they believe, that they know we want something for them, we don't want anything from them, and that we can make it simple for those people to connect with God. Just real quick story, after the first service, a uh, gentleman comes in, young guy in his 20s, comes in the suite to introduce himself to me. He says, I've been here two times, and you just described me. He said, I walked away from church as a kid, you know, after I was a kid, as I grew up. He said, I've been out of church for a long time. I'm just now reconstructing my faith and putting it back together, and it seems like this is the kind of place for me. I say, yes, it is. We actually built it for people like you. So that's what makes it different. 
We want to make sure every adult, and we want to make sure every kid, and we want to make sure every student, that it's simple for them to connect with Jesus. That's easy. When we talk about kids and students and what we're doing on that other side of the building, the way we say it is we want to help kids and students build a faith that lasts a lifetime. Because, listen, the, the challenges, the demands, the difficulties that teenagers, young adults are facing today, it's so unique, it's so different, it's so much harder than it was when we grew up. And for them to be able to build a faith that lasts a lifetime means God becomes so personal to them and they become so confident that he's with them that when they become an adult, all the challenges, and you know what comes our way, and some of you high schoolers, you're in the room right now, you get this, all, all the challenges that start coming your way. We, we want you to have a faith so strong that nothing shakes that, that you know God's with you in the middle of it, that your faith can withstand all those different things that happen to you in life. I was reminded of this back last June. Um, I was invited to speak at Inside Out. If you're not familiar, it's something, environment we create every Wednesday night for high school students. They asked me to come in and speak, and so um, I did, and I decided I wanted to have a little dialogue back and forth with them, and I, I wanted to learn from them more than they were going to learn from me. And so I asked them a question. I said, here's what I want to know. What problems and pain have you seen your friends facing in the last three months? I said, just think about the friends you hang out with. What are the things they're going through? What are the struggles? What are the challenges? And I wish you could have seen the whole list. They, they put a massive list that I just wrote down on a, on a huge 3M pad. It was a massive list of things that their friends were facing. I'll show you just a few of them they mentioned. They talked about things like bullying, anxiety, depression, their parents going through a divorce, gossip, loneliness, stress, addiction, self-esteem, eating disorders, time demands. Do you remember when you were, now some of you are high schoolers, but those of you who are older, you remember when you were a high schooler? What were your time demands? Mine was, am I going to play Madden or NBA Jam? I couldn't figure it out. I mean, but you know this, if you've got a high schooler or you're around high schoolers, they have so much on their plate now that time management is actually an issue for them. It's a challenge. Mental health, they talked about mental health stuff. And so when they got done listing all of this stuff, here's what I said to them. I said, all right, I know not only your friends are facing all this stuff, you're facing it. You're dealing with it. But you have an advantage. And the advantage you have is you're here. The advantage you have is you are building a faith where you have confidence that God is with you in the middle of all this. And the advantage you have is you're here and you're surrounded not only by peers, but you're surrounded by adults who are investing in you and care about you and love you. And they're walking with you through all of this. I said, imagine your friends who aren't here and they're not in any church and they don't have that. Imagine trying to navigate through all of this as a teenager or a young adult and you felt like you were all alone. And then I shared something with those high schoolers that was a surprise to them. I said, if we take the counties that you come from and we calculate how many of your friends, how many high schoolers in those counties are not in church. There's 1,750 high school students not in church every week. So there's 1,750 high school students just right here around us, just in the couple counties where high schoolers currently come to Inside Out, who they're walking through life navigating all this. They don't have any support. In some cases, they don't even have their family. And in case you are wondering, if we take all of the counties that are connected with Calway that you come from, there's 142,932 people not in church today. So there are all these adults navigating through all this as well. Without any confidence, God's with them, he cares about them, he's going to walk with them through it. So I said, just imagine what that's like. It's hard enough when you have a faith in God and you're surrounded by people who love you and care about you and are going to support you. But imagine doing it all alone. And so then I asked these students one last question. I said, you think about your friends who aren't in church, part of that 1,750. I said, why do they not come to church? And I won't give you all the answers, but it was you could guess them. It was exactly what you would expect. They said, well, they don't find it helpful. They don't find it relevant. They, it's boring. They come in, and they don't feel like they belong. They, they don't feel like they're accepted. I mean, they went through the list of exactly what you would expe expect. Oddly enough, the one thing they never said is, well, they don't like Jesus. And that, this is what I find over and over again. I mean, you think about your friends. Have you ever had a friend who's not in church look at you and say, 
I just can't stand that Jesus guy. No way I'm coming. No, they don't do that, do they? They will rant for hours about the church and all the things wrong with the church and hypocrites and here they did this and they hurt my parents, you know, that I, they'll rant for hours about church. You get to Jesus and they're like, oh, I like him actually. Yeah, it's like, what is wrong with that picture, you know? Can't stand people who follow him, but man, he's fine. Y'all should be more like him. So there's actually good news in that. The good news in that is every reason that your friends and my friends and our high schoolers' friends, every reason they're not in church is a fixable reason. It's all fixable. All the barriers they're presenting, uh, preventing them from coming, they can all be removed. I mean, if they were saying, well, we just don't like Jesus, we don't believe anything he taught, well, that's different. But that's not what they're saying. It's stuff that's easy to fix. But most churches, and I'm talking in generalities, most churches are not willing to fix it. You know why? Well, because human nature for all of us, once we get here and we get what we want and we're enjoying it and it's helping us, human nature is just to continue to do what's easy, comfy, and convenient. Human nature is just to focus on ourselves. But you cannot do what's easy, comfy, and convenient and remove barriers for people who are not yet here. You actually have to look outside of yourself and be willing to selflessly love and care for somebody else enough to say, it's not convenient for me, but I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it simple for you. And whenever, and again, I'm just talking in generalities, but whenever Christians, whenever churches refuse to do that, it's as if we are looking at these people and saying, you can just go to hell, literally, I feel like I needed to add that because my mom, somebody will clip that and then my mom will see it and she'll call me, you were cursing in church. I'll be like, no, mom, I was literally. So anyway, we're, we're literally saying you can, you can just go to hell because we're not willing to give up what's easy, comfy, and convenient for us to make it better for you to come. It's fixable. Barriers are removable. But we're comfortable. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not, Hopefully this is going to be encouraging to you. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, come on. That is not what Jesus modeled for us. It is not what he taught us. It is not what he did for us. Jesus proved and modeled we should do whatever it takes to make it simple for people to connect with God. But it does make us uncomfortable in the process. It's not the easiest thing to do. So Luke, I don't know if you're familiar with Luke. Luke wrote an account of Jesus' life. It's my favorite account personally, and the reason is because Luke was not one of Jesus' early followers. He began following Jesus later after the resurrection. And then Luke said, I want to figure out if all this is true. So he questioned, talked with, you know, interviewed all kinds of people who had been eyewitnesses of everything Jesus had done, and he put an account together. So it's like a third-party independent investigation type of account. And Luke tells us in Luke 15, which is a passage we've come back to over and over again as a church, he tells us in Luke 15 that Jesus was crystal clear about this. And the way he sets it up is he says this. He says, now the tax collectors and the sinners, they were all gathering around to hear Jesus. So I do not have time to talk about this, but you should just spend a little bit of time thinking about that. The people who were most unlike Jesus, the people who never showed up to church, they absolutely loved hanging out with Jesus. So it's really weird that people who aren't in church today don't really like hanging out with us. Maybe we're not as much like Jesus as we think we are. That's another story for another day because they loved hanging out with him. The people who had problems with it were the religious people. Luke says, but the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they muttered, well, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. In other words, this ain't right. We, we, why in the world would he hang out with those people? And the reason they couldn't understand it, they couldn't figure it out, is because they couldn't wrap their head around who God cared about and that he would possibly care about people who were far from him. And so Jesus, he's hearing all this, and he decides to tell three stories. I'm not going to read you the third one. It's the most emotional. It's the most personal. I hope you'll go home and read it for yourself. You would definitely enjoy it. It's a phenomenal story. But I'll read you the first two, where Jesus was trying to help them understand, no, 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 you've got this all wrong. His first story went like this. He said, suppose... One of you has a hundred sheep, which you're like, what does that have to do with anything? But this is how Jesus always did it. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. He loses one of them. 
This happened in their culture all the time. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country? Go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And they're like, well, yeah, of course he does. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. Everybody listening to the story is like, well, yeah, that happens fairly frequently. Yep. Jesus says, all right, well, here's my point. He says, in the same way, I tell you, in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And all these religious people who are listening to this are like, that can't be true. You got to be kidding me. That can't be true. Jesus says, yeah, let me, let me tell you another story. Maybe you'll get it with this one. He says, or suppose... A woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one, which again doesn't translate to us, but these were valuable coins back then. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And everybody's like, of course she does. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. Everybody's like, yep, that's exactly how it happens. Jesus says, when the same way, I'll tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In other words, Jesus is like, Every time somebody far from me connects or reconnects with their heavenly father, heaven throws a party. That's how much God cares. That's how excited he is that they're back reconnected with him. And all the religious people are like, that can't be right. I mean, we know God loves everybody, but it's kind of like parents. He's got to have a favorite, you know, loves everybody, but there's that one, you know. God's got to love us a little bit more than everybody else. Look at how we're living. Look at all the things we're doing to try to follow him. Jesus is like, nope, you got it backwards. You're actually not the favorite. People far from God. This was Jesus' point. People far from God. There it is. Matter deeply to God. People far from God. They matter deeply to God. That's who he's focused on. And whenever one of them comes back, Jesus says, oh, my gosh, there's a party that breaks out in heaven. Now, if that bothers you, if you're a Jesus follower and that bothers you a little bit, just think of it this way. This is no different than when a parent loses a child in the park. And when they finally find that child, what does the mom do? Oh, my gosh, the response is so emotional. It's just through the roof. And then she takes that child and they go back to the car and the other kids are sitting in the car and she has no response. Why? Because the other two kids are safe. They're where they're supposed to be. Everything's good with them. But oh my gosh, she's so thrilled and overjoyed that this kid who ran away she thought she might never find has been found. Meanwhile, the other two kids are in the car going, that ain't fair. I, I think she loves him more. She's asking him what he wants for dinner. She never asked us what we want for dinner. But they're safe. They've got everything, right? This is Jesus' point. That whenever somebody is lost relationally, whenever somebody's far from their heavenly father, he cares so much that they connect or reconnect with him. And all of us who are following him, it's awesome. He loves us, but we're good. We're safe. We're in the car where we're supposed to be. He's not worried about us. But he's not sure if that one's ever going to come back. And so they throw a party whenever he does. They throw a party whenever she does. Because people far from God matter deeply to him. So, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're trying to figure all this out, this is exactly what I hope you walk away with today. That you matter that much to God. That your heavenly father cares about you that much. And if you're new around Journey and you're one of these people who's not sure and you're trying to figure it out, I just hope you walk away with the fact that we prioritize you. We don't always get it right, but as best we can, we prioritize you above ourselves. Because that's what our leader does as well. Now, for the next few minutes as I wrap this up, I just need to talk to those of you who are called Journey Home. You say this is your church. So if you're new or you know, you're just trying to figure all this out. You can just sit back and listen in. This doesn't apply to you. Because for all of us who call Journey Home, this has been the mission 
that we have been organized around that has been central to us from day one. And as I told you at the beginning, what God has done through you over the last two years in helping move that mission forward has been extraordinary. It's been extraordinary. As a matter of fact, it's created problems for us that are great problems, but created them way faster than we thought. Um, last January, about 13 months ago, internally we started having conversations as a staff and as a board, and, you know, all the people. We started having conversations around what are we going to do because we're running out of space. Now, there's, some, there's seats still here, but and there's seats at the 9 a.m. service, but in our kids' area with our students, we're running out of space. What are we going to do? And if you're not aware, we're at a point now where our high school students don't have a lot of space left to, to invite friends. Our 6th through 8th grade students don't have a lot of space left to invite friends. Our K through 5th grade students don't have a lot of space left to invite friends. And we just didn't want to get to the point where we were looking at kids or students and saying, hey, we don't have room for you. You're coming to try to connect with God and build a faith that will last a lifetime, but we don't have room for you. That just felt terrible to us. So we started trying to figure out what to do. And if you're new around here, you won't be as aware of this, but when we built this facility, we built it um, with the plan to add on in the future to do a phase two over here in this grassy area. Um, and so we thought, well, we can look at that. And so we started talking to some contractors. And since we, since we have built this building, as you probably know, all the contracting prices have doubled. Everything's twice as expensive as it was. So we said, hey, how much would that cost over there? And they said, hey, just about $10 million. And I said, how many lottery tickets would it take to... <laughs> I don't play the lottery. Never mind. So anyway, that wasn't going to work. So we started looking at other alternatives, okay, the most economical. And we explored everything, and I'm not going to tell you what all that is. But we have come up with a plan that I want to tell you about here in just a minute, a plan to add some space that would actually solve all of our space problems on that side of the building for a while. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a preliminary general rendering of what it would look like because visually it'll be easier to understand but here's the thing I want you to know before I show it to you what I'm about to and I'll tell you why this is true in a minute but what I'm about to show you is not accurate did you hear me look at the person next to you and say this isn't accurate just go ahead because six months from now one of you are going to come to me and say that was in a picture and I don't see it and I'm going to say I told you it was not accurate and I'll tell you why in a second it wasn't accurate all right but here is an option that could solve our problem. So if we, if we just went to that far end of the building and we extended that, our building that way, 3,600 square feet, it would create this space right here, okay? And that space would become student space for high schoolers, for middle schoolers on Sunday morning, sixth or eighth graders, and it would do something else. It would free up the current student space we have and we could take some of our older K through fifth graders and put them in there, and it would create uh, two different rooms for our K through fifth graders. So basically, 3,600 square feet, it um, doubles our high school space. It allows us to have about 100 high schoolers plus volunteers that we serve every week. It would allow us to have about 100 middle schoolers plus volunteers every week, so it would double our middle school space. And then it would double our K through fifth grade space. Um, and allow us to program a little better for the younger K through fifth graders versus the older ones. They would be in two separate rooms. So <clears throat> we began to explore this option back in the fall as we started figuring this out. Um, and you'll see here with this option, there's this outdoor space. Once again, the outdoor space will not look like this. Don't even know if we could afford it, but it will not look like this. But let me tell you why we want to create an outdoor space um, off of this room out into the woods. The reason's because our high school students um, on Wednesday nights right now when they meet, they do all their programming, you know, have their group discussions and do all of that. And then when they get finished, whenever the weather's good, most of the year, they're able to go outside and they go out in the woods and they do what they call a fourth meal. Now, you've never heard of a fourth meal. Let me explain to you why they have a fourth meal. Because three meals are not enough for high schoolers. That's <laughs> why they have a fourth one. Those people eat like horses. So... They're always hungry by the end. So we cater a meal in every week, okay? We bring food in, give them a full meal every week, and they absolutely love hanging outside afterwards with their friends and their small group leaders or their group leaders. They, um, they eat, they sit around fire pits, they 
play games sometimes. It's just a chill time. Um, and one of the thing, reasons this is such a big deal for high school students, you remember the whole time management piece? Their lives are so busy now. They tell us this is, for many of them, the only time they have in their week just to chill and hang with friends. And so it's really valuable relationship building time for them and their friends and them and their group leaders. And so we thought, okay, if we could create a little more proper space for them that made it easier to serve the food, made it easier to hang out. You know, we put some actual uh, gas fire pits in here that are going to be a little safer. Right now it's just light a match and flame it up. That's what they do. Um, it's how we weed out the dumb kids. I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> We've not lost any high schoolers. It's all fine. Y'all got smart high school students. They hadn't killed themselves. But we could certainly, we keep it safe, but we could certainly make it a little safer. So anyway, we thought, let's try to create a space for them like that. All right, so um, we started conversations with our contractor, our general contractor about this and what it would look like. Um, and again, we're not, we don't have any of this firmed up, but it looks like, we could build a space like this for around $1.2 to $1.3 million, all right? That would take care of that. Now, a couple things about this. Part of the reason it's so expensive is because steel buildings have doubled in price in the last two years. Uh, concrete's gone up. Everything's gone up. You understand that. Um, and those of you who are farmers or you've got land and you put up metal buildings, you're like, oh, I could put up a metal building a lot cheaper than that. Yes, but yours do not require... Uh, sprinkler systems and yours do not require seismic ratings to make sure you know we're trying to keep the kids safe if something happens uh, you just throw yours up and roll so there's a lot more that we have to put into ours to make sure it meets code and it's on and on and on so 1.2 to 1.3 million dollars um, which is an insane amount of money for that space but that's just the going rate and it's not going to go down it's just going to keep going up so it's probably the cheapest we could ever build it and it sounds a lot better after you think about $10 million, doesn't it? It's like, oh, we have a bargain. Here we go. So, so anyway, that's about what that'll cost. If we were to do this, uh, we're going to pay cash for it uh, because we don't want to add any more debt uh, to what we have. So we would pay cash, which caused someone last week to ask me the question. It was a great question. Well, do we have the cash for that? And I said to them, well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we actually have the cash for this. The bad news is it's currently sitting in your bank accounts. <laughs> makes it a little harder. It's sitting in mine too, believe me. I've been looking at mine like it's not going to look that good for very long. So, so anyway, anyway, here's the thing. If you are newer around here, here's what you need to know. Uh, first of all, we do not take a pressure approach with any of this, all right? If you're wondering, well, this church never votes on anything. Well, you're about to get to vote, but you're not raising your hand because that's a cheap, easy way. You're going to vote with your money. That's how we're going to decide whether to do this or not. The reason I'm not bringing anything, anything to you that's been firm and finalized is because we're going to see if we're willing to do it first. And if we're willing to do it, we're close enough. We can get it started this year, and we can be in it by early spring and have, a, have more space for kids and students. So no pressure, but here's the way this is going to work. Um, if you're part of Journey, I would love for you to pray about and think about this question. How much, there it is, how much extra are you willing to give for the next 12 months? So if you gave uh, $1,000 last year, I'm going to make up a number, and you're like, well, I could give $1,500 this year, then your answer to this question is $500. If you gave nothing, you're going to give something, well, your answer is the something, right? It's just how much above what you invested here last year are you willing to give in the next 12 months to help fund this? And... We're going to give you between now and March 24th to let us know what that is. And I'll tell you how in a minute. And then we'll look, and if we feel like, okay, enough people are on board with this, then we'll get the ball rolling, we'll move fast, and we'll get this thing started. Um, now, the good news is this. We're not starting from zero. You know, $1.2 million, $1.3, it sounds like a ton of money, but we are not starting from zero. I went to a bit of a randomized group of people uh, in our church, I've talked to a lot of people in our church actually to get feedback on this, and overwhelmingly it's been very positive. Um, but I asked 22 different families, 22 different households, if they would be willing to pre-commit to know whether or not we even thought this was feasible. And those 22 households have already committed $367,000 towards this. So we are, yeah, so we are off and running with a good start, 
but um, we need you to finish it. So here's, here's how this will work. You're not going to remember everything I just said. So what you can do is this. You can go to our app. Uh, you can scan the QR code, or you can go to journeycalway.com slash build. You will find everything I talk about, doubling the sp all the spaces that will get doubled, um, all the stuff I just mentioned, the price, everything's there. So you can go here and you can find it all. And at the bottom, there is a simple little form where if you would be willing, between now and March 24th, I need you to tell us through the form, hey, here's how much extra in the next 12 months I've been, I'd be willing to give to help fund this. All right? Now, just real quick, I know some of you, and I get this, I know some of you do not like uh, making, it feels like a promise to you. And we're not going to hold you to it, but we're not going to track you down if you don't. But it feels like a promise to you, so you're like, I'm not going to give anything. Well, that's great, but it's actually going to make it really hard for us to make this decision. So in this case, if you would just tell us, it would help, and I would get better sleep, I promise you. So if you could do that, that would be awesome. And then assuming everything looks good, okay, on the week of March 24th, our offering for that week, for that Sunday, we're going to take every penny of that offering and we're going to put it towards this facility to get us jump started. And on Easter Sunday, I'll tell you exactly where we were and what we're going to do and let you know moving forward. Does that make sense? So you're going to have questions. You're not going to remember all this. You're going to be confused about something. I get it. Just reach out and ask. Um, not going to email, call, whatever you need to do. We're happy to talk to you and address it all. Last thing, and I got to let you go before the volunteers over there on that side have a mutiny against me. So here's, here's the last thing I want you to think about. The thing I keep coming back to is why. Why? Let me tell you why we're not doing this. We're not doing it because we care about buildings and facilities. It's just more to maintain. It's just more work. No pastor ever wakes up going, I can't wait to raise money and build a building. I can promise you that. It's just a lot of headache. We're not doing it because we want to be bigger for bigger's sake. Every extra person that comes here is more work on me. So it's easy. It would be easy for us to cruise, to just be comfortable, because everything's good. But I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I keep coming back to. The why are these numbers right here. Because that number and that number, they represent people. They represent people who need to know that they matter to their heavenly father, that they matter to us. They represent people who need to know that they can belong here, even if they don't believe like us yet, behave like us, think like us, dress like us, vote like us. It doesn't matter. These are people who somebody needs to make it simple for them to connect with Jesus. And so that's why Jen and I have already committed to give some of our money to this. It's why I want to invite you to do the same. Because somebody did it for you and somebody did it for me. These people deserve for somebody to do it for them. Everybody matters to God, whether God matters to them or not. Let me pray for us. Father, we're grateful for the people you sent to our lives and their willingness to let go of what's comfy and easy and convenient to help us connect with you. And would you just give us wisdom to know how best to do that for the people who aren't yet here? Um, give us wisdom to know how best to steward this opportunity you put in our hands so we can create a place and a space for more kids and more students to build a faith in you that lasts a lifetime for them. It's in Jesus' name we pray.